Keith asked me to talk about temperature and flowering. And so there's a lot of things I'm not going to talk about today, but we drifted onto a lot of those topics actually in the question and answers in the other two places. What I am going to try to focus on is the impact of temperature on avocado flowering and fruit set. So just in getting ready to think about this, there's many, many processes involved in flowering that are impacted by temperature. And that includes the induction of flowering. So there is a very, very small protein called FT. And the FT is uh, the protein that travels through the apical merosome of each of the little shoots on the avocado tree. And its, its production is triggered by many, many different things. But it is very much it's triggered by day length. And it's triggered by temperature are two of the main trigger points. So there's many different pathways to make FT. One is cold, and there is pathways from um, warmer uh, temperature in general. And so we don't really understand how FT operates in avocado, but we know that that is probably involved in floral induction, which occurs about three or four months, approximately, before you see avocado flowers, OK? Uh, flowering and fruit set, many things, pollination, fertilization, I'm going to touch upon that. The timing of the male and female phases of the flower, I'll talk about that. Pollinator activity, I'm not going to talk about, but I think anybody who runs bees in their hives know that the bees are impacted by low temperature and high temperature. And so temperatures, you could have the perfect conditions, but if the pollinator is not moving around in your orchard, then you, you're going to have problems. The presence of pollinizers, I'll show you some little data about that. And then environmental conditions, of course, temperature. In order to um, uh, talk about temperature as a whole, though, I want to review avocado flowering and terminology with you so that when I get to the end of the talk, we're all on the same page. Just to review the avocado flower, it's made up of different parts. And the avocado has a perfect flower. So the female portion of the flower is in the center of the flower. It, is, it consists of the ovary, which gives rise to the fruit, actually. The ovule, where the seed becomes the seed, and where the embryo is. And then you have the style, and then you have the stigma. And the stigma is where the pollen will land. The pollen has to germinate here on the stigma and grow down, down to the base of the ovule, and then that's where you have fertilization. So you need, you need pollen deposition on the stigma, you need pollen growth, you need pollen growth down to the ovule, and then you need that um, fertilization in order to get fruit set. The uh, avocado is also have the male portion, so it's a perfect flower. And so the anthers, the male portion of the flower, surrounds the, uh, the female portion of the flower. So this is a picture of the female phase. And here is a picture of the male phase down below. So you can see in the female phase that the, um, when the flower is open in the female phase, the, the, the ovary and the style and the stigma are standing straight up. Here's a picture of it. And the male portion of the flower is laying down flat against the uh, tuples. This is actually called tuples, not petals or sepals, but tuples. And um, this is up in the pollen will land here. Now the flower closes, and then at some point after it closes, the, the, what happens while it's closed is that you get more nectar production out of the nectaries. You get the stamens and, uh, growing, actually. You get the pollen um, maturing, getting ready to be shed. And the flower actually grows by about 15, 20% in size. So a lot of things happen between the time that the flower closes after the female phase and opens up as a male phase. And what you see then when it opens up in the male phase, the stamens are standing straight up. 
And after some time, it depends on temperature, little, these flaps open on the end of each um, anther, and this is where the pollen is released. So the pollen is released once these little flaps open and the pollen grains are here. And so if you look carefully here, right here, this is a flap on one of the anthers where the pollen is about to be released. These are where the nectar is being produced in, in, in the flower. And many times you will see that the, the tepals actually will recurve in, in the late male phase. So a lot of people over the years have done a lot of research on that here in California and elsewhere. And this is just a diagram of different stages of avocado flowering. This was described by Gadi Sham, a researcher from Israel in his PhD thesis. And you can see he describes four different stages of female flower and five stages of the male phase. So um, that is very good. So. Here what you have here in this picture, so I told you when the, fl the female flower is open, the pollen, you need to get away to get the pollen to land on the stigma. And then you have to have a certain amount, there's been a lot of research on how many pollen grains do you need on the stigma to get good fertilization. So Cheval was one of the first people, he was a researcher from Israel, he said you have to have more than 20 pollen grains. And Naki Hamanza did some research in Spain, he says, you know, it's not 20, you need more than 40. And recently, David Padamore and a group of researchers from Australia and New Zealand are hypothesizing that you actually really need like 80 to 100 pollen grains on the somatic surface actually to get good fertilization. And what happens is because there's hundreds of thousands of flowers on the avocado tree, there's many flowers that have no pollen or only one or two pollen grains on it. So your challenge as a grower is that you need to get the vector who carries the pollen, which we use as a honeybee, to visit as many flowers as possible and, and to have a lot of pollen on it. And uh, once the pollen lands, this is a picture from Anaki Hermanza. These little circles are the pollen grains. The, the stomatic surface is very rich in nutrients and carbohydrates, and it triggers the pollen grain to germinate. And what you see now is these are the pollen grains beginning their journey from here down into the ovule. And it's, a, it's, a, it's basically a numbers game. It's very similar to human reproduction, that you need a lot of uh, male sperm to, uh, to uh, reach the egg, because they sort of work in competition and in cooperation with, you, with each other. And, and, and the situation in avocado is analogous to that. So once the pollen tube is, is growing down, it'll grow down into what they call the transmitting tissue. It'll grow down like this, it'll come back up here, and this is where fertilization takes place. So the, this outside tissue is the maternal tissue. So that is, you know, if it's a hasp plant, what becomes the skin and the peel of the fruit is maternal tissue. What, and the cotyledons, is maternal tissue, but the embryo is, is the product of the fertilization. And here in this picture, here is the embryo. Now, we all know, uh, hopefully, that you know, it, it, it's more complicated in avocado, so you have this flower that opens first as female, closes, becomes male, and then we also have uh, different varieties that have different timing of when they're female and male. And so this is just a list of A varieties and B varieties, just a small listing of that, that I, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with. And then this is some uh, data that we've collected. Hass is up here on the top. And this is four years of data that we collected in Irvine where we, we marked down when did we see the first open flower and when did we see the last open flower. And so the point here being, is that it varies from year to year. It's impacted by crop load. So typically when you have a heavy, if you're carrying a heavy crop load on the tree, flowering is normally delayed. And actually the, the, the length of the flowering period is normally uh, shortened a little bit. 
And you can see that in some varieties are more effective than others. Here you can see in this particular year, both lamb has and surprise had a very short flowering period. But the idea here is that we need to select pollinizer varieties. In this slide, we have surprise BL667 and BL516 that could be pollinizers to these A varieties here. And so you need to sort of be thinking about that when you select the pollinizer variety that you're gonna use in your orchard. And also you need to have, in my opinion, a mix of pollinizer varieties so that you can always catch that optimum window for the A variety that you're growing. Or if you were growing a B variety, we used to be Forte grow industry. Forte is a B flower. And so then you needed to be looking at A flower types that could be effective pollinizers for Forte, which is a B. So what, what is the difference between A and B flowers? This is the paradigm. And then I'm gonna spend the rest of the talk talking about how the paradigm falls apart due to temperature. But we'll start off with the paradigm. And a lot of this basic work, initial work describing this was done here in California and in Florida 100 years ago by Narodi and Stout. So, uh, and the work uh, in California was done in La Jolla. But anyway, what they describe is that you have an A flower type that opens up female in the morning. The flower is open typically to about midday. Then the flower closes in the afternoon. It's closed in the afternoon, all evening, the following morning, and in the afternoon of the second day, it opens up as male. The B flower type is the reverse. It opens up female in the afternoon, it closes and is closed overnight, and then it opens up male the following morning. So when you think about it then, the avocado is designed for cross-pollination because you have these different flower types. So you have the, the movement, you can have the movement of pollen from the B flower type in the morning to the female stage or the A flower type in the, in the morning. And in the afternoon, the A flower type, which is a male phase, can move pollen to the female stage of the B flower type. So that, that's really, really nice, a nice system. And, um, but people say, well, you know, I only have a grove of house. I don't need a pollinizer. And how do, how do, how do people then, I just told you, we have this, this system for cross-pollination, but how do you get flowering if you only have a house grove? And so what, that, what this is, is that um, here's the A flower type. The blue bar is the timing of the, uh, under the paradigm, the flowering of uh, the A flower type. And then this yellow bar is when the, the, female, the male flower just opens, but those flaps have not opened up to release the pollen. The orange portion here is when the, the pollen is actually being released. So you see within the A flower type, you do have a certain amount of time of overlap. Now keep this in mind because I'm gonna come back to this later in the talk, this overlap. And in type B, you have the same thing, it's a sort of reverse. Here's a female flower in the afternoon, they're male in the morning, and so it's at the end of the male phase that you can get this pollination within the same variety in the afternoon. Or I mean midday, but within the same tree. So we do know that overlap can occur. This is a picture of Hass flowers. Here's a female phase flower, and here's a male phase flower, and you can see they're both in the same inflorescence. So for more terminology, we have that graph I just showed you. And so cross-pollination, cross-pollination is a movement of the pollen from a different variety of avocado to another variety. So in this case, we have the pollen moving from a type B to a type A here in the morning and from a type A to a type B in the afternoon. So that's called cross-pollination. And then we have another thing called close pollination. So close pollination is a movement of the pollen within the same variety. Not the same flower, but the same variety. So just like in that picture I just showed you, you had the male and the female phase flower, two different flowers. And that if you have a vector that can move that pollen from that male phase flower to the female phase flower, you have what we call close pollination. 
And that occur can occur then in both A and B flower types. Now there's a, there's a third type of pollina uh, pollination you can have and that's self-pollination. But thinking now about how the flower operates, do you think you can really get self-pollination, true self-pollination in an avocado? And I would say probably not. Because if the stigma where the pollen lands stays receptive, it's possible that you could have a pollen grain from the same flower land on that stigma. But most research has shown that the stigma ha does not stay receptive. It loses its receptivity, its ability to help the pollen grain germinate while the flower is closed between the phases. Now there is probably situations where it can stay receptive in areas of the right temperature, high humidity, but it's probably not likely. It's also not likely in inland valleys where it is more, the humidity is lower and we have higher temperatures. Okay, so probably the, the ability to have self, true self-pollination in avocado is probably a rare event. Close pollination, does occur, we know it occurs, because you could have a completely has grove, no pollinizers, you can still get a crop. We know that cross-pollination occurs. Now the question is, and I'm not gonna address this, but I leave it with you to think about, is if, if this organism has evolved to have this very elaborate flowering protocol, do you think cross-pollination benefits fruit set and avocado? I'll leave it for you to think about. Given that it's gone through evolution to come up with this very complex and convoluted flowering schedule. So now we're going to move on to the role of temperature and relative humidity. And so one of the very first things that happened, so temperature drives floral development. We're not talking about that today, but once the trees begin to flower, the very first thing happens is that those pollen grains have to land on the stigmas. And this is a picture of an avocado stigma, and, and this is a close-up. And if you look carefully, there's a lot of pollen grains on here. And here you can see some pollen grains, and they're starting to grow down. This is the, the middle of the style. And the, and the pollen grains will grow down through the pollen tubes down this transmitting tissue. But the very first thing you have to have happen is the pollen grain not only has to land on the stigma, it has to adhere or stick to the stigmatic surface in order to be triggered to germinate. And Anaki Hermanza, who, is a, who has talked to, uh, 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 in California to us before about flowering, he asked that question, how about pollen tube adhesion to the stigma pollen and also then the, the influence of temperature and humidity on the germination of the pollen grain to grow down the stigma. I'm not going to show you the adhesion data because the adhesion data is very similar to the humidity to the data up here. But just know that that in also influences the ability of uh, starting the whole process of fertilization. So right here on this left side we have relative humidity and he, the, he did this in the laboratory. He looked at pollen grain germination. You can do this in the lab at different humidity, 50, 75, and 95% humidity. And he was interested just because he also was looking at stigma receptivity, of whether the stigma was receptive in the masculine stage. So he, he looked at both the feminine and the masculine uh, phase of flowering. But I think what you can clearly see here is that between 50 and 75 percent, you go from roughly 40 percent of the pollen grains germinating to about 60 percent of the pollen grains. So there's two messages here. Number one, not every single pollen grain will germinate on the stigma. And number two is that humidity uh, plays a big role on how much pollen grains will germinate. And it looks like, you know, the threshold for good germination, over 50 percent pollen grain germination is going to occur somewhere above 50% humidity. So on days that are dry, we have low humidity. We may have perfect temperature, but we have low humidity, you know, that th there could be an effect on the ability of those pollen grains that are landing on the stigma to actually germinate. 
Now here's temperature, I apologize, this is in Celsius. 15 degrees Celsius is 59 degrees Fahrenheit, 68 Fahrenheit, 77 Fahrenheit, and 86. And then this is uh, what they found out in the field. Because again, he did this in the laboratory. But what you see is the optimum, especially in the female stage, the optimum pollen germination occurs at 77 degrees. And this is all done on Hass. And the thing is, the sweet spot for Hass for photosynthesis, the best rate of photosynthesis for Hass also occurs at around uh, 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So the point here being is that, you know, the germination is also occurring probably because a tree has maximum photosynthesis at that point in time. And um, all the biological processes, at least for Hass, is optimized at that temperature. So you can see that, um, and you have high temperature, which we can often have also during flowering, you have very poor uh, pollen germination. Okay, so temperature of the day that, it, that the, the trees are, are being pollinated will influence how many pollen grains can germinate. And you need the pollen to germinate in order to get the, the tree, the fruit set. So um, Keith actually asked me to talk about some work that uh, Margaret Sedgley, a researcher in Australia, conducted. And she was from the University of Adelaide in southern Australia. And she did a lot of work on avocados. And um, in this experiment, they took Hass avocado flowers and they, and they kept them at, th uh, they had a 12-hour 12 day, 12 day, 12-hour night. They kept them at either 91, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 77, 68, or 63, 54. And then they looked at what happened uh, when the flowers were open. So the first thing is they shot down the paradigm because they found that at the, the low temperature regime, 63, 54, that flowering for the Hass, this is all work on Hass, went from roughly 36 hours to 72 hours. So everything was delayed. Everything was delayed. It took a lot longer. And it's likely that that affects the ovule where the pollen tube grows has a finite life. It's not good forever. And, and the estimate from talking to Anaki Hamaza is probably about 48 hours. And, and then you start getting... Um, um, the ovule to lose viability. So then again, there's another effect. The overlap. So they looked at that overlap, that opportunity for close pollination. And they found that that was influenced by temperature and they had the longest overlap when the temperature was 77, 68. Again, so this overlap is influenced by temperature. They looked at the fertilization rate. And they found that they got fertilization at all different temperatures, but the rate of fertilization was the lowest at 63.54, but they've extended the, uh, the duration of the flowering cycle as well. And you know then the pollen tubes are growing at a much slower rate. The ovule is degenerating probably at a certain percentage. And so fertilization is the lowest at the low temperature. How about embryo development? Because after fertilization, you have to have that embryo develop in order to get the seed, which gives you also the fruit. And so they found that they had embryo development at all the different temperatures, but the, all the fruitlets subsized at the high temperature, which was uh, 91 and 82. And growth was very, very slow at low temperature. So in the end, the optimum temperature was 77, 68, which we know from other work is sort of the optimum range for Hass avocado. So there's been other research done on high temperature, some more work that Margaret Sedgley did. They were looking at growing avocados in northern Australia, very hot, very humid, and they were getting very poor performance of Hass and Guatemalan Mexican race avocados. And I went, if you go to the people in Florida, they don't grow Hass either because it doesn't perform well. When I first got hired, Marvin Miller was this retired farm advisor from Riverside County. And he told me, oh, you know, in the 40s and 50s, we tried growing avocados down in Coachella Valley. The trees grew, they were beautiful, but we never got any fruit. 
Same question. So what they did is that they compared a, 30, uh, a 9173 12-hour day, 12-hour night, to a 7759. And what they found is that, first of all, they had fewer flowers at the high temperature regime. And they found actually at that very high temperatures, they actually inhibited flower formation. What happened is the flower develops in sequence. So first you have the, the, the tuples are formed, and then you have the, uh, the stamens develop, and then the final thing is the ovule. And so they found that in a, a certain percentage of the flowers, flower development stopped at the development of the male portion of the flower. And then they had flowers that would never even open at the high temperature. So it tells us that, yeah, high temperature can impact flowering. And I know we have 91 degree days sometimes during flowering. Another important piece of work I think that affects f fruit set and yield is work that was done by Tony Wiley that was published in 1988. And by the way, this information, if you really want to read these papers, is on avocado source. So they, what Wiley did is they looked at what happens to the evapotranspiration of the tree during flowering. And they, they calculated, because you know we have hundreds of thousands of flowers on an avocado tree. They're very small, but they, they contribute a lot to the surface area of the, fruit, of the tree. And he, they calculated that the surface area of the tree actually increases by about 90% during flowering. So you have, you've increased this transpirational surface area of the tree when the tree is flowering. And they actually uh, s concluded that it accounted for a 13% higher increase in water loss off the surface of the tree. So that goes back to the idea that if we, if we have warm conditions, dry conditions during flowering, being on top of your irrigation is, is probably important. So that's not really a temperature effect but it's a, an outcome of the temperature effect, especially if we have anything that increases the evapotranspiration demand for the tree. Now, a lot, a lot more work has been done on low temperatures, and I think that's sort of what we're interested in as well. So work that was done again by Sedgley and, and by Peterson. Peterson was a researcher who published in the Avocado Society yearbook back in 1956. Remember, Forte is the number one variety there, and he was looking at what may, you know, what's the problem with Forte? It doesn't set a lot of fruit. And he concluded, and Margaret Sedgley concluded, that B flower types appear to be more impacted by lower temperatures than the A flower types. Gadi Sham um, did some work where, he, and I'm going to show you a little bit of his data, where he summarized average daily temperature and timing of the various stages. I'm going to show you some graphs there. And you'll see that the paradigm is basically shot full of holes. And, um, and then more recently, in, uh, nine, just two years ago, David Padamore uh, published some data where he was looking at, it, people have noted that the flowers stay open overnight. And so in New Zealand and Australia, I guess that's a major phenomena. And so he's been looking at, well, if the flowers stay open overnight, can you get fruit set and can you have and any in kind of insect will visit the flowers and cause pollination in, uh, when the flowers are open. And in fact, he just published a paper two months ago where they, they looked at what was visited by uh, the avocado flowers, and they found that at least in Australia and New Zealand, they get these nocturnal moths. Now, they haven't proven that they can fertilize or pollinate the avocado flower, but they hypothesize that perhaps it's happening. So that's sort of interesting. So this is going back to Gadi Sham. So this is Haas flowers. And what they did is they, 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 took, the, uh, they took the average daily temperature. So they took the min and the max, and they averaged it. And again, I apologize, this is all in Celsius. 12 degrees Celsius is 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's 68. Here's just about 75. And 26 is just shy of 80 degrees. OK, so we're running between the mid-50s to about 80 degrees. And he looked at the different stages of flower opening. So the F stages, these black squares and the black triangle, are female stages. And the open circles are basically male stages. And by doing that, 
This is the end of the female phase where the flowers are closed. And this, the, the open box is where the pollen is released. Okay, so what he's showing you here is that window of time that you can have close pollination within halves. Now this work was done in Israel. They have similar conditions than we do. So the first thing you, you see is that yes, there is a period of time during the flowering cycle that you can have close pollination. But that duration of time is greatly influenced by temperature. So when you have the warmer average daily temperature, that window of time for close pollination narrows. And it, it's about just shy of two hours here at cooler temperatures. So yes, you can have close pollination. If you have a lot of bees moving around in your, in your grove, this can be an effective way, but you have to realize this is all impacted by temperature. And it's a relatively short period of time. So in Israel, they use Edinger as their main pollinizer variety. So this graph shows then the Edinger. And so if you look at this portion of the bar, uh, of the graph, this is when you have that open window where the Edinger is releasing pollen and the stigma and the female phase of the flower is ready to take the pollen. And you can see that period of time is much larger. So at the low temperature, again, driven by temperature, at the lower temperature, you have about four hours. And actually, it's greater than seven hours when you get to the higher temperature. OK? So that would argue, go back to the question I asked you, OK, you can get fruit set with having a solid set of trees, but can you increase your odds for fruit set if you have a, a bee, a, a, for like for Hass, a bee flower type? And in fact, this is just a bar that a graph I made from that, his data, where the blue bar is for close pollination. And this is a cool day. So the average temperature is below 14 degrees Celsius, which is about 58 degrees Fahrenheit. You have a, just shy of two hours for close pollination and about four and a half hours for cross pollination. When you have a warm day, this is the average temperature is greater than 68 degrees. That drops down to about a half an hour for close pollination. And it's actually seven hours or greater for cross pollination. So temperature is driving all of this. Temperature makes this situation extremely dynamic. Now we'll move to David Padamore. David Padamore approached temperature in a little bit different way. This is data that he published in 2018. They looked at the overnight minimum temperature. Now, again, in Celsius, so four degrees is about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. You have to remember, he's doing this research in New Zealand. They're cooler than us. So four degrees, uh, 40, about 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Six degrees is about 44. 10 is 50. 12 is 54. And 16 is um, just about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And they did this over multiple years. And then you can see that this is a time after sunrise that the flower opens up as female. And so at the lower temperatures, you delay the, this is hours. So this is, so this is not 4 o'clock in the morning. This is 10 hours after sunrise. So if sunrise is at 6 o'clock, the flowers are not opening up as female until 10 hours after 6 o'clock, which is what? Four o'clock in the afternoon. And here, down in here, where you have around 60 degrees um, overnight minimum, the the, it's opening up around uh, 11 to 12 o'clock in the morning. OK? So it shows, it goes along with what um, Gadi Sham did, is that temperature is influencing when the flowers open. He also looked at what the shaded and the non-shaded side of the tree, and not, not surprisingly, you get the flowers on the shaded side of the tree opening up later than uh, the, on the sunny side of the tree. Not surprising. So he looked at then the impact of temperature also on the percentage of flowers that remain open overnight. And you can see at the lower temperature range, you have more, a higher percentage of flowers that are in the female phase because you've, 
you've delayed the opening of the female face. Remember in this graph, as, as late as four o'clock in the afternoon, and he found that 50% of the flowers actually stayed open overnight. And we saw the same thing. We, we weren't thinking about it in the same way that David Padamore is doing, but when we had our pollinizer trial in Oxnard at Debeshire, we followed flowering in detail on individual flowers. And on those very cool mornings over in Oxnard, we indeed saw open flowers the following morning because we delayed opening of the female there as well. And you can see then when the, the nighttime temperatures are a little bit warmer, this is around 55 to 59, you have less than 10% of the flowers because the flowers are opening earlier and they can do their thing as a female flower. He also looked at male phase and it's slightly the reverse because when you have cold temperatures, the male flower doesn't open up in the morning. It typically opens up in the, in the morning. I mean, it doesn't open up in the afternoon. It opens up the following morning. And so you, you'll, you'll end up having lower amounts of male flowers being open at low temperature. I hope that makes sense, sort of the reverse. So what about conditions in California? So I showed you data from Israel. I showed you data from Australia. But what about California? So this is real California data, actually collected here in Ventura County, <clears throat> in Oxnard, and in Santa Paula. It's old data, but the data is still. Uh... So what we did, this is work that Loretta Bates did as part of a BARD project that I had with uh, Sharoni Shafir in Israel and uh, Tom Davenport in Florida. And so here is a day where the day was 87 degrees, but it was um, fall, um, uh, followed by a 47 degree night. I'm, I'm sorry, the 47 degree night actually pre preceded the day. It was 87 degrees during the day and 47 degrees the, the previous night. That's reversed, I'm sorry. And um, what you see is that the female phase of, this, of these avocado flowers, they were female from about 10 to noon. Okay, so it's a warm day, so the female phase is truncated. It was a little bit cool, so they had a little bit of a delayed opening, but they were female in the morning. So following the paradigm, and here is the male phase, so they're male in the afternoon, but you can see there's basically no overlap. Now this lower one is a 43 degree night, followed by a 68 degree day, so similar to some of the stuff that Margaret Sedgley did, you can see, first of all, that female stage is greatly delayed. Now it's in the afternoon from roughly about 1.30 in the afternoon to about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So all of a sudden, this A flower type is acting like a B flower type if you didn't really know what you were looking at. And that the male phase is also um, uh, delayed. Now how about the pollinizer? So, Here's two graphs. Hass is down here on the bottom. And you can see where the female phase is on both of these graphs. So in this case, it's female from about 11.30 in the afternoon to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And here it's delayed to about um, later, about 1 o'clock to after 4 o'clock. And this is a moderate night temperature. It was 50 degrees, followed by a moderate day, 75 degrees. And then these are two pollinizer riser surprise and BL516. And you can see that they're lined up pretty good. So they, they're going to be able to provide pollen to the house under these temperature conditions. Now here, where we had a cool night temperature, 43 degrees at night was the pre-dawn minimum. It was followed by a warm day of 80 degrees. Here, the male phase of both surprise and BL516 or didn't move very much. But you can see now the Hass has moved so it's later. So here in this case, Surprise is going to be a better, a slightly better pollinizer for um, Hass than the BL516. Does that, can you see that? For the cross-pollination. And um, so temperature is not only influencing what Hass is doing, it's influencing the ability it has to be receptive to pollen from other varieties. So 
I went down and I went to the SIMA station in Santa Paula and I downloaded the, temp the min-max temperatures that we had during the flowering period in 2021. So the red line is the max, the blue line is minimum, and you can see the minimum temperatures uh, range from, this is Celsius, so I'm sorry, but they range from about a low of about 35 degrees one night to a high of about um, 60. Those were the minimum temperatures, and you can see the variability in the high temperatures, high here, in, just shy of 90, and a, a, a coolest day was here right in the low 60s. And so thinking about it, this is during the flowering cycle when Hass is flowering, you have all this tremendous day-to-day -day variability, and so you go, how in the world do I process all this information Mary Lou just showed me about the influence of temperature? And I have an answer for you. Oh, the, by the way, this is Camarillo. You can see Camarillo. It's a little bit different, but very similar to Santa Paula. So when we were doing the work in the pollinizer trial at Debeshire, and we were following all these individual flowers, we were also collecting a lot of temperature data. And what Loretta did is so she took the data and she went to a statistician and we were able to develop our own little temperature model. Okay, and the temperature model we developed took the pre-dawn minimum. So the minimum temperature two hours before sunrise. And we used that to predict when the, the female phase of the flower would open. And similar to what Gadi Sham showed and David Padamar showed is that the colder the temperature at night, um, the later the flower opens. And here I made, I, I went and I, cal I, what I did is I took the temperatures and if you have a pre-dawn minimum of 40 degrees, the model predicts that the flowers will not open until one o'clock in the afternoon as female. If you have a, a, a let's say a 70 degree pre-dawn minimum, which we never would have, though they're gonna open at seven in the morning. But typically what we see is that we have 50 to 55 degrees and it predicts that the, you should see female phase flowers open between nine and 10 o'clock in the morning. Does that make sense? Okay, so how can you use this? And I can easily provide you this model. So if you have a temperature recorder, what I did is I took all those minimum temperatures that I was able to download from Simus, and what you see here then is the day-to-day, -day here is the minimum temperature variability across the flowering time for Hass for Santa Paula for this year, and I took that data and I, was, I applied the model, and this would be the prediction of when you would see female flowers. Now I know some people um, are blowing pollen onto their trees, you, you have to be very careful about what day do you blow the pollen on the trees or what day do you put the pollen at the, at the entrance of the, of the beehive so that they can carry the pollen to the flower. And I would say, you know, you need to be looking at the temperatures. You need to have a temperature recorder. And you don't really want to probably apply the pollen on days where the flowers aren't even going to open until 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You want to apply the pollen on days where the, the female flowers are gonna be doing what they're supposed to be doing and opening up in the morning. Because you wanna give plenty of time for that pollen to germinate and grow down to the ovule and cause fertilization in the avocado flower. So here's a practical application of using a, degree, a, a model like this to predict when should I put pollen out if I'm going to put supplemental pollen on the avocado tree. It also uh, you know, it just tells you how narrow we may have a long flowering period. But really, what we saw at Debeshire many in the six years we did, in many years, we never saw a fruit set until May and June. And it makes sense when you look at this because that's when we had uh, um, warmer nighttime temperatures. And so the flowers were behaving more like what they should. This is uh, data from Temecula. You can see what happened this year in Temecula that using that model. This is San Luis Obispo. And if we put all three together, what we have is a green line is Temecula, 
the um, orange line is Santa Paula and the blue line is San Luis Obispo. So Santa Paula, we, I downloaded multiple years of temperature data and I was very surprised that Santa Paula follows San Luis Obispo in terms of minimum temperatures very closely. I was really, really actually amazed, except at the end of the flowering cycle. I also looked at Santa Barbara data. Santa Barbara acts, because maybe it's coastal, it's more moderated, acts more like Temecula. And Temecula is very consistent that it's a little, especially at the end of the flowering season, is warmer than up here. So it's really interesting to think about it and think about, you know, when we say we have poor fruit set, probably the key, one of the keys to poor fruit set over and beyond everything else is, is being temperature driven. And unfortunately, we can't control temperature. But what we have to do is do everything possible to make sure the tree is ready to be pollinated and the, and the flowers are ready to be fertilized and ready to set fruit. So what can we conclude? The factors involved in avocado flowering and fruit set are extremely complex. And what we know about avocado flowering could probably fit on the tip of a pin. And so we know very little. We don't, you know, we're, we're, we, have, we have many different pollinizer varieties. A lot of people use Zutano, a lot of people use bacon. We don't really know how that all fits into all of this. Um, we're about to release BL516 as a pollinizer variety for Hass. And I have to tell you, I don't, I don't have, the, I have a little bit of data from Debeshire, but I don't have the final answers. I didn't touch upon the effect of uh, temperature on the, on the pollinator, the vector of pollen for us, which is a honeybee. And, um, and we're probably lucky that the avocado tree at least has flowers over a very long period of time because we need every single opportunity we can have because of temperature to make sure that we get good fruit set. So with that, I wanna thank you very much. I wanna thank Keith for asking me to uh, give this talk and I'd be more than happy to answer some questions. Um, the female flowers that are open overnight, is there any data on how they set? Is that you know, extended, uh, you know, cool opening? In David Padamore, who's really been looking at the open flower phenomena, he doesn't have anything in his papers about fruit set. What I can tell you from Debeshire, because Loretta followed individual flowers till they fell off. The flowers that were open in the evening rarely set at Debeshire, which was by Point Magoo. So I, th I think probably not because they're, they're open during, you know, you go back and think about the work Margaret Sedgley does, you know, ovule, uh, pollen tube growth is more protracted. Ov uh, embryo development is more protracted. It's not ideal for setting fruit. All right, one of your slides uh, indicated with warmer temperatures, you get a higher percentage of fruitlet abscission. At very high temperature. And I think that's a problem in the valley, potentially. Okay. So. So I guess I'm wondering, when, when is that abscission occurring? And is, is that separate from what we typically see with the first blast of warm weather? I think the, 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 these two publications are not clear on that one. Um, the, that first work by Sedgley was done in the lab, so I think it's very, very, very small. The work that they did in, North, in Northern Australia, part of that was done in the field. And so they probably saw the pea-sized fruit. So, it, yeah, you know, I think, you know, we've, we've had crop failure. I remember the year that my son was born. I only remember it because we, were, we had this heat spell because we were having the baptism for him. Um, right during the middle of avocado bloom. And we had temperatures over 100 degrees and we had a catastrophic crop failure in California because we had these very high temperatures. So we had a nice crop load going into that heat wave and then people lost their fruit. So I think what you, it, 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 that makes the valley a little bit more challenging. The other thing is we looked at, Loretta looked at flowering up at Lynn Cove and saw no overlap. Very, very little overlap. And, and the trees follow the paradigm more closely 
in warmer areas than it does in cooler areas. So where the paradigm of A and B flower types and the timing falls apart is when you move closer to the coast and you have cooler temperatures. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith.